How's it going guys? I am back and I'm building a computer today uh, for the first time in I guess only about a month or so but I feel like I'm getting back to my roots because I'm building a computer that you guys might be able to build as well or at least a variant of this computer. You could assemble the core components of this build to get yourself a functionally similar one for around $620 as I demonstrated in my recent monthly builds video. I'm building a slightly different variant of that because I wanted to go mini ITX. I wanted to try out this new Z5i case from G-Skill and use a few other parts here that uh, I thought it might be interesting to try out. So if you wanna check the parts list for either variant of this build, it's in the description down below. And I am featuring the AMD Ryzen 5600G which should hopefully be up for sale today for 260 US dollars and which also has integrated graphics, which means we don't need to spend crazy amounts of money on a graphics card. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Divider 300, a unique mid-tower case with a triangular tempered glass side panel. This allows for a mid-panel slot that provides extra ventilation for your GPU, and you can remove the glass and steel panels individually. The divider also comes with three 120mm addressable RGB fans pre-installed at the front, a 120mm rear fan for exhaust, built-in dust filters, USB Type-C on the front panel, vertical GPU mount support, and more. For additional info on the Divider 300, click the sponsor link in the video description. Before I get into the parts for this build, I feel like I should take the plastic off of this case because um, my daughter has decorated it with, with beautiful stickers, um, but it is also covered in plastic wrap, so just a moment. All right, I got all that plastic wrap off of there. Here's a quick rundown of the parts we're using, starting, of course, with our processor, the new AMD Ryzen 5 5600G. And again, I say new, but this has been available via system integrators and OEMs for quite some time now. Currently retailing for 260 US dollars. It's going to perform a little bit not quite as good as the 5600X due to it having half of the cache. However, it will definitely outperform a 3600 from uh, the previous generation, and it does have the latest Zen 3 uh, seven nanometer architecture in there and the built-in graphics. They are Vega graphics, which are a little bit outdated, but they're still a lot better than having no graphics card or having to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a ridiculously overpriced graphics card right now. Vega 7 graphics integrated in this one for the 5600G. There's Vega 8 in the 5700G. However, the performance difference between them is pretty minimal. So for my money, since we're going with the budget build today and aiming for around 600 to $650 total price, the 5600G is the way to go. For storage today, I'm using a Samsung 960 Pro, which is a 512 gig NVMe SSD with the M.2 2280 form factor, which is pretty common for NVMe SSDs. This drive is a little bit nicer, a little bit faster than the one I'm recommending in the uh, video description down below, which is a Team and M33. In terms of gaming though, you're not gonna see too much of a difference between these, and this is a 512 gig drive just like that one. Of course, more storage is uh, gonna be one of the key things you might want to add on to this build, so consider upping this to a a one terabyte NVMe SSD if you can afford that, or just keep an eye out for a, like a nice SATA 2.5 inch SSD that you could add on to give yourself some more storage on top of this 512 gigs, which is where the operating system is going to be installed. Our motherboard is the Asus ROG Strix B550-i Gaming. And this motherboard, I like, I'm a little torn about this motherboard because on the one hand, it's using the B550 chipset, which is the more budget chipset from AMD, but that still provides overclocking support. And really the main thing you'd get with X570 is the ability to have two-way GPU configurations. And two-way GPU configurations have kind of gone the way of the Dodo at this point. And with a mini ITX build, you wouldn't really have room for that anyway. So B550 makes sense. However, this motherboard does cost over $200, about $210 as of the last time I checked. So you are paying a premium. However, you do get a nice set of features like a USB 3.2 Gen 2 front panel port, a very nice power delivery configuration. So it will handle all of the CPUs on this platform all the way up to a 5950X, even if you want to overclock them. And it's got built-in Wi-Fi six, a nice set of display outputs. That is something you should also double check if you're going to be using an APU is to make sure you're not using one of the higher end uh, AM4 motherboards that does not have display outputs. And it's got a couple M.2 slots, including one with a pretty big heat sink on it, as well as for a mini ITX board, a very nice set of fan connectors. For our power supply, I have a brand new unit that I haven't tried out before. This is a, a new power supply from Lian Lee. They now have an SFX unit. It's called the SP750. It is fully modular. It's 80 plus gold rated. It has nice all black cables. So it's a, a nice all around power supply. It even comes with a five year warranty from Lian Lee. So uh, they sent this over over just a few weeks ago and I thought, hey, next time I do a mini ITX build, I'll give this a shot and that's what I'm doing today. 
So that's what I'm doing. Our case is the G-Skill Z5i, and G-Skill is not known for cases. In fact, to my knowledge, they haven't really done much with cases before. However, this case has already won a 2021 IF Design Award as well as a Red Dot Award. So, you know, that's not insignificant. And it's got a pretty unique layout for a Mini ITX case. It's got sort of a hexagonal design if you're looking at it from the top. It's got a curved tempered glass side panel that swings out from the side, actually both sides swing out. And it does have triple slot GPU support so you can drop in a really high-end graphics card into this system which we won't be doing today but that's the whole idea of this build is that it's expandable for the future so if you wanted to add a graphics card if you want to upgrade your experience hopefully once gpu prices come down you can do that finally we have a fancy new kit of memory here which is the trident z royal elite i'm using this kit today because uh, g skill sent it over and i hadn't had any use for it yet i'm also using it because although this specific kit of memory or at least the 16 gigabyte variant this is actually the 32 gig kit which has four eight gig sticks in it i've only got two dim slots so obviously i can't use all of these but uh, but the memory that I'm recommending for this build, if you're assembling the $620 version, is pretty much the exact same specs, which is DDR4 3600 and cast latency 16, 16, 19, 19, 39. Other than that, this memory is just here to make things look pretty. As you can see, G-Skill added even more fractalization or, or tessellation or whatever you want to call it on the sides there. And then it's still got the uh, fancy blingy RGB feature on top as you might uh, recognize from their existing Royal series. So those are the parts I'm building with today. I'll walk you guys through the process and point out uh, unique or quirky things that come up along the way. Let's get started. So we're gonna work on setting up the motherboard here, which I've gotten out of the box, and it will ship usually with a back plate installed in these little brackets, which are held on by four screws. Just undid those screws to remove that. We will need the back plate in order to install our cooler, which is the Race Stealth, which comes along with our 5600G processor. This is not the best cooler, but it does come with uh, thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom, and it will get us by for now with the potential to upgrade it in the future if it's not pulling its weight. But uh, again, we're going with a budget build, so saving a little bit of money on a CPU cooler is definitely not something we should skip over. Beyond the CPU and the heatsink fan though, I've got both sticks of memory and I've got our little Samsung 960 Pro M.2 NVMe drive. I've also pulled out uh, the tiny, tiny little screw and uh, nut adapter to install that onto the motherboard. And I've got a tiny screwdriver as well. Now the first thing I'm going to install is our M.2 NVMe drive, and there's actually a couple places to install that. One is right here, under this M.2 heatsink. This is one of two slots on the board where it could be installed. The other one is here on the back, and that is uh, tucked away, but note that this one isn't going to be very accessible once the motherboard is installed into the case. Also note that since this is a B550 motherboard, this M.2 slot is PCI Express Gen 3, whereas the one on this side is PCI Express Gen 4. Since this is a PCI Express Gen 3 drive, and since I've double checked and the 960 Pro is not necessarily that prone to overheating, I think what I'm gonna do is install it on the back of the motherboard here. That way I won't be sort of wasting the PCI Express Gen 4 bandwidth from this slot. If my SSD was one that was prone to overheating and some of them are more prone than others, you should just look up uh, stats for your specific SSD if you're concerned about that. I would install it on the side with the heatsink, but I think this gives us a little bit more flexibility for upgrading in the future too, because this slot here is still gonna be accessible somewhat uh, from the front of our case. All you'd have to do is remove these screws. So if you were to add on a PCI Express Gen 4 M.2 SSD in the future, then that would be open and ready for it. And for the installation itself, we have a nut that's going to screw onto the board side. This is the slimmer one of these because there's not a whole lot of space on the motherboard's backside. I'm just going to tighten this down a little bit with my screwdriver. And then we have the tiniest of screws that's gonna hold this in, so you might need a screwdriver that has a very small Phillips head tip. Other than that, we just pop the SSD into the M.2 slot side. That will lay down flat on the board. And then we tighten it down with our teeny, 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 tiny screw, just like and there we go, SSD's installed. Next, we're gonna install our CPU to the AM4 socket right here. To do that, we have a lever arm right here, so we're just going to lift that up to sort of open up the socket. Then note that the CPU has a gold triangle on one corner, and although it's hard to see, there is a triangle that's also etched into the corner of the socket right here. That also happens to coincide, at least with these CPUs, with the corner that uh, has kind of a square cutout in the pins at the bottom. We're trying to be careful not to touch those pins on the bottom of the CPU, but we're going to simply drop this into the socket, 
with what is known as zero insertion force, which means it should drop down in there. I didn't have to push down at all. And then we simply secure it by lowering the lever arm. Next, I'm gonna put the back plate back onto the back of the motherboard and flip it over so that we ha now have screws on this side, but we are gonna need to hold it in place. But we now have screw down mounting points on this side of the board, and that is where our heat sink fan installs, and that uh, already has the sort of uh, spring-loaded screws that are pre-attached to it. And that just needs, yet again, a Phillips head screwdriver. I mentioned I'm gonna point out interesting little conflicts or unique things that come up as I'm building. And I'm finding that the uh, little AMD part of this heat sink that sticks out a little bit is actually conflicting with the uh, sort of heat sink array with the fan on it that's cooling the chipset and a bunch of other VRM components here on this ASUS motherboard. Therefore, I'm going to simply rotate this uh, 180 degrees and install it this way instead. The main thing to note for CPU heatsink fan installation is that you want to uh, tighten down the four corners a little bit at a time so you don't put too much pressure on one corner of the CPU. So the first thing I do is just go and get each one threaded uh, with a couple twists. So that's all four corners threaded down now and then I'm just going to tighten down a couple twists going to opposite corners and then the two others that I skipped over until all of these screws are bottomed out and tightened down as much as they can be tightened down. So there we go, our heatsink fan is now installed. This is now a very sturdy attachment on the motherboard, so uh, if you need to, you can lift up the whole unit by the heatsink fan at this point. Last thing I'm gonna do is plug in the cable for the fan, and I'm just gonna wrap that around the side here, which works out to give us just enough cable length to plug into the CPU fan header on this board, which uh, is conveniently in sort of a gray color versus the black fan headers that are next to it. Oh, and look what I did. I, I moved my protrusive AMD logo, uh, and really this is just purely an aesthetic thing on the heatsink over here, and now it's conflicting with my RAM slots. Never fear, this would have been a little bit easier to do uh, prior to installing the heatsink fan. Fortunately, the shroud isn't too difficult to remove, and uh, actually removing it and rotating it will allow us to make this build a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. There's just a couple plastic catches that sort of snap around the outside here. That allows you to pop that off. It would be convenient to just pop this off, rotate it 45 degrees and snap it back on, but we actually have to rotate the entire fan unit that's underneath it. Fortunately, that's only held on by four screws. So we're just going to unscrew those, then we'll rotate it 45 degrees and then we will screw it all back down. All right, so there we go, 45 degree rotation. These little prongs are now on top and I can snap this cover back on like so. And hey, bonus, we now have the proper orientation with the AMD logo up on top. I just need to yet again plug in the CPU fan. I'm gonna need to reroute the cable just a little bit here. There we go, not too bad. And the last thing here for motherboard prep is going to be to install the memory. We have two dim slots. Sometimes they have these little latches on both sides and some motherboards have uh, only the latches on one side and it just snaps in on this side. Either way, open up the catches where they do exist, and then you're gonna wanna line up uh, the little notch that's at the center. It's not directly in the center, it's slightly off center. So we just wanna make sure that that's lined up with the notch where it is on the board itself. Align each side of the memory, and then we give it firm pressure straight down, and it snaps right in. Very satisfying feeling. Memory is one of the easier things to install into a motherboard. You just gotta, again, nice firm pressure to snap it in. One of the things I really like about many ITX builds is just how compact the, the power, like the, the functional part of the system is. This is four of the six components, the motherboard, the storage, the CPU, and the memory, all in this tiny little package right here. So all we need to do is install this in the case, install the power supply, and plug that in, and pretty much our system is all set up. So next up, let's take a closer look at this case. So here is the Z5i, Z5i, however you want to call it, from G-Skill. And this is, is a pretty cool and pretty unique Mini ITX case. And that's part of the reason I said, okay, when G-Skill said, hey, do you want to take a look at this? It's because it's a design that I haven't really seen before. So it's got two tempered glass side panels that are curved and that swing out like this. And one thing that we've already discovered is since the tempered glass side panels are kind of heavy and the rest of the case is not, uh, it actually makes it a little bit side heavy, I guess. So um, if you're swinging out these side panels, especially if there's no hardware in the case, highly recommended to slide them off like that, just so the case doesn't have a danger of tipping over. And same deal on this side, side panel. Oop. <laughs> 
Same deal on this side, side panel swings out. And if you want an example of what I'm talking about, there it is. So yeah, fortunately, these are really easy to just slide off the hinges in the back. So what we're looking at here is the graphics card side of the case. And you can see there's a riser cable that goes uh, from here over to here. However, again, this is my biggest complaint with this case having uh, taken a look at some early reviews is that this is a Gen 3 riser cable and not a Gen 4. So it's definitely worth double checking that your motherboard is set to Gen 3 mode before installing a Gen 4 graphics card that because that is something that can cause a conflict with a cable like this. Other than that, uh, you're just talking about a little bit more limited bandwidth with a Gen 3 cable. So it's it's not going to be the end of the world. However, if you did want to have maximum support and compatibility with the latest graphics cards, uh, a Gen 4 cable would be a good upgrade to upgrade to. However, you do have three uh, expansion slots down here at the bottom, and you do have plenty of vertical length for a graphics card in the case. There is a spot up here where you could potentially put either a 2.5 inch SSD or a 3.5 inch hard drive. That would potentially limit the length of the graphics card you can install, but uh, there's still Plenty of length there, so depending on the configuration, you've got lots of space here. I'm only spending so much time on this side of the case right now, because I'm not going to be using it after this, because we're not installing a graphics card today. However, when I do uh, test this build out, I feel like that is something that I should drop in there just to see how the upgrade path goes. For drive support, if you want a 3.5 inch mechanical drive, this is the only spot where you can put one with the uh, four pre-grommeted holes that are there. You also might note these little notched holes right here, that's for a 2.5 inch SSD. You can install one here, and then it's hard to see, but you'll, you've also got those same notched holes, uh, a set of them here, and a set of them right here, so that allows you to install up to three 2.5 inch SSDs. It does have a little brushed metal uh, piece here at the front, which I am currently peeling the plastic off of. Oh no, I tore it. Oh dear. Oh no, it's wrapped around and oh, I hate when that happens. It's got caught up in there a little bit. Don't worry, you can work around it. So here's your front panel IO effectively. You've got a power button right there, a couple USB 3.0 and that USB 3.2 Gen 2 type C port, which is nice to have. Uh, no mic and headphone jack on this. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with no front panel mic and headphone. That is often a port that I just don't bother using anyway because they're often lower quality than plugging directly into the back of the motherboard. Right up here though is, uh, well, these are your front panel cables, but this is where your power supply is gonna sit. So do note that if you install the 3.5 inch mechanical drive right here, you're gonna need to remove your power supply in order to uninstall that. Um, probably not something that a lot of people are gonna encounter, but just something to keep in mind. There's a little extension here for the power supply. So that would plug into the power supply side and then that runs down to the bottom of the case so you can actually plug in uh, your power cable. And note that since the motherboard is gonna sit down here, and this is where the riser cable would wrap around, although it's kind of wedged in there. I'll just, I'll just leave that there for now. But motherboard goes right here. IO goes down there. So yeah, all of the IO on this case is actually going to be coming out the bottom. And you know, for a rotated motherboard orientation, typically you either have to have it coming out the top or coming out the bottom. So that is, I guess, a little bit of a pain in the butt to access the ports on your graphics card and your motherboard. However, once you got stuff plugged in, you just write it back here and out this notch at the back of the case. So at least you're not in a situation where with some cases they're coming out the top and you've got to kind of route them back that way and then down, because that can be kind of a pain in the but rounding out the features though, we do have a G-Skill logo down there and I believe that will light up uh, an RGB as well as some RGB underglow lighting around the base of the case. And then this whole area back here is sort of the area that's set, set aside for a radiator. So I imagine, you know, there's not a ton of extra room in this case, but custom loop. I mean, I, I'm sure someone could try to wedge something like that in here. Probably more likely this would be used for an all-in-one CPU cooler because you could easily just pass your uh, CPU block pump over to your motherboard right there. And that does support either a 240 millimeter or 280 millimeter radiator. Uh, but also note that this is the only place on the case where you can install fans. So two 120s or two 140s is also the only fan uh, support that you have back there. So that's where your ventilation is gonna come from. And also note that this case does not ship with fans. So if you're gonna want some airflow right out of the gate, you're probably wanna get, gonna wanna add on at least a fan or two to this setup. And I think I'm at least gonna drop one in here for an intake to blow some uh, fresh air across our motherboard area down there where most of the action is gonna be happening. Oh, oh, and there's one last thing, which is that the top of the case here, which is probably gonna be exhaust, uh, this is actually a metal mesh filter that uh, grows across the top of that. It doesn't have any edging or anything like that, but uh, it's a pretty sturdy piece of metal mesh. And since it is metal, uh, there's just some magnets on the top of the case that's hold it in place right there. So pretty easy to pop that off to clean the dust out.
So the build process in this case was not too difficult. Uh, it's got pretty good cable management routing areas. There's tie down points up here above the motherboard and that's where most of the action is happening as far as the power for the motherboard as well as your uh, front panel connectors. So I was able to get those wired in there and I could cinch things down a little bit more here, but I feel like for the uh, second part of this video, which is gonna be testing this system out, I wanna leave things a little bit flexible in there because I do want to uh, maybe add some more hardware onto this system because that's what I've been realizing as I'm putting this all together is like the whole computer is right here. I have a big space here where, you know, there's room for a radiator. I didn't install a single Be Quiet Silent Wings 3 fan in there, which is a nice quiet fan from, from Be Quiet. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of uh, intake ventilation for the main system. And then just there's, there's lots of open space here because like I said, my intent for the budget version of this build, the $620-ish dollar version, as well as this uh, more, more fancy version that I'm building today is for it to be upgradable. Add a graphics card in, maybe expand your storage, maybe expand your cooling, stuff like that, because what's the point of building a computer yourself if you're not gonna take it apart at some point and rebuild it to be better. All that said, at this point, uh, we can go ahead and reassemble our system by popping these side panels back on. Well, this can be my first test at accessing the IO on the bottom of this case. Since it is a small case, it's not too difficult to tilt to the side to get at the power cable and that, and that sort of thing. And for the sake of superstition, I'll leave the side panel open while I power the system on for the first time uh, with, oh wait, I should also make sure that the power switch is on right there. And hey, the system seems to be uh, powering up. That's a good thing. We have RGB with the G-Skill logo and the underglow down there at the bottom. And uh, the motherboard seems to be functional as well with a nice little bit of extra RGB from our G-Skill Trident Z Royal Elite memory. So I do have some closing thoughts, but before that, let's do a little peel here for the side panel windows and give you guys a closer look at this build in its current shape and form. Oh, hey, speaking of PC building superstition, I cut myself. Uh, this build has now been anointed with my own blood. And as we all know, that's very good luck when you're building a computer. <laughs> So I've had a good time putting the system together today. I, I like building computers if I haven't made that evidence on my channel in the past. But uh, the one question that keeps coming back to my mind is, are you gonna be able to build a computer similar to this at any time soon as well? And whether that's my 620-ish dollar entry-level version of this build, or whether you've uh, added some more components to make it suit your tastes a little bit more like I've done today, none of this will be possible for you guys to assemble at home unless these CPUs remain in stock. The Ryzen 5 5600G, which sort of had a consumer launch a couple days ago, and today should be up for sale. But will they still be up for sale at the end of the day today, or tomorrow, or a week from now. If I'm looking at the stock situation with the Ryzen 5000 series of CPUs, that's actually gotten better and better as the year has gone on now. And we have the 5900X and the 5950X in stock. So I am hopeful that the 5600G and the 5700G will be around as an option for anyone who needs to build a system, but is dealing with that ongoing situation with the GPU shortage. As for this case, the Z5i from G-Skill, I feel like they did a pretty good job with it in terms of creating a unique case that has a distinct look. It's able to fit a pretty good amount of hardware and a pretty small form factor. It's a really small footprint on the desk and goes a little bit more vertical, kind of in the same way that the Thermaltake Tower 100 did. However, it is a little bit smaller than the Thermaltake Tower 100, but it's also about 100 bucks more expensive and it uses an SFX power supply, which is also gonna cost a little bit more money. I'm curious to see how this system performs as is, as well as with some potential upgrades. So if you guys can help me out, leave me comments in the comment section down below and let me know how you'd like to see me test this build. We've got the base APU configuration right now. Do you think I should upgrade the CPU cooling? Uh, I'm probably gonna add a graphics card, but what graphics card should I install? Should I just go really high end or should I find something that's actually kind of in the mid range and somewhat obtainable? So leave me your thoughts in the comment section down below. Also links to all the parts I built with are in the description as well as the, again, less expensive 620-ish dollar version of this build. And I'll be back later this month with some more testing on this system. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button on your way out and don't forget to check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and my ever popular bamboo coasters. Thanks again for watching this one, you guys, and we'll see you in the next video.